this is Dr. Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel Medicine Decoded. Now in our last video we had talked about intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis, we talked about group B streptococci and we were discussing about uh, the intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis in PPROM at the end of that video. Now in this video I will be discussing PROM in detail. Now to begin with I would like to tell you that give up the habit of calling it premature rupture of membranes because it just confuses uh, the diagnosis. I mean when you call it premature rupture of membranes, you confuse it with preterm rupture of membranes, right? So call it as pre-labor rupture of membranes, that's what PROM is. Now membranes can rupture and leaking happens during the course of labor, right? And it's usual, it's normal, right? And membranes can rupture anytime during the course of labor. When membranes rupture and leaking happens before onset of labor, that is PROM, pre-labor rupture of membranes. Now it can happen at term, that means this may happen after the woman has completed 37 weeks of gestation, we call it as term PROM. And when it happens, before 37 weeks of gestation, we call it as preterm PROM, PPROM, right? And let's make a distinction here of something that we would like to call pre-viable PPROM, okay? Now pre-viable meaning that the membranes have ruptured before the fetus has managed to reach the stage of viability. That means independent existence outside of the uterus, right? Now this period of viability differs in different countries. Even in the same country, it can differ in different healthcare setups depending upon the facilities of neonatal resuscitation, NICU facilities, newborn care facilities, right? So yes, as in Western countries, they say that the period of viability is 24 weeks, right? We talk about in terms of thresholds of period of viability and, uh, you know, between that threshold, let's say 24 to 28 weeks or 26 weeks, we have to see uh, the viability depending on case to case basis, right? So this could differ, uh, what you call as pre-viable could differ uh, depending upon under what circumstances you are practicing. So let's just identify that also, a pre-viable PPROM. Now moving on, what could be the consequences if membranes rupture before the actual onset of labor, pre-labor rupture of membranes, right? So you can see here in this diagram, this yellow line is depicting the fetal membranes. They have ruptured and the amniotic fluid has leaked out, okay? And there is this uh, a disturbance that is created in the uh, chorio-decidual, uh, between the chorio-decidual lining, right? And also uh, uh, a tract uh, that is created for ascending infection upwards uh, into the uterine cavity towards the fetus, towards the fetal membranes, towards the decidua, right? So all these can lead to different kinds of consequences. The most common consequence is actually onset of labor, triggering of labor, right? So when membranes rupture, labor is often triggered. All right. The nearer to term she is, the faster she will go into labor. All right. Remember that, right? So how soon she will go into labor depend upon her gestational age that membranes rupture took place. So labor onset and if it happened preterm, then obviously woman can go into preterm labor. Neonatal complications of prematurity will happen, of course, if she ends up delivering uh, after going into preterm labor, isn't it? Now, the other consequences, like I told you, can be infection and chorioamnionitis. Uh, if left unchecked, this can even lead to maternal septicemia. Chorioamnionitis uh, in itself is uh, going to be problematic because uh, 
chorioamnionitis uh, can lead to uh, uh, you know fetal infection also and infection of the decidua also chorioamnitis can present uh, can progress to neonatal sepsis to uh, maternal sepsis right so chorioamnitis can also lead to uh, different complications per se the other complication that can happen is cord prolapse right so the umbilical cord is inside the uterine cavity along with the fetus here and it doesn't slip out because the os is closed because the membranes are intact right but as and when this woman will go into labor and the cervix will open up the membranes aren't there right the liker has come out the cord can also slip out right and you can understand here that cord prolapse also becomes more likely in situations where preterm prom has happened because uh, with prematurity with preterm presentation uh, mal presentations are more likely right and the head may not yet be engaged right so one thing can lead to another the other complication that can happen is placental abruption right so when the membranes rupture and the umbilical uh, and the uh, sorry the amniotic fluid gushes out you know there can be a sudden decompression inside the uterine cavity that can trigger premature separation of the placenta it can lead to placental abruption it can also be seen in chronic long standing uh, preterm uh, prom cases as well and the other complication is oligohydroamnios right so yes when the liker is going to leak out and nothing of the liker remains inside it leads to decreased amount of amniotic fluid inside right now when that happens at term it can lead to uh, or when that happens at preterm also doesn't matter whenever it happens it can lead to uh, cord compression repeated episodes of cord compression can lead to meconium passage by the fetus can also lead to a uh, variable decelerations if this happens recurrently it can lead to uh, fetal hypoxia as well so that is one complication another important complication of oligohydroamnios is seen typically in pre viable fetuses right when pre viable preterm prom happens before 24 22 weeks of gestation now that uh, what that does is it does not allow or does not give space for the lung expansion of the fetus to take place and by 22 24 weeks the lung development is not complete right so it can lead to pulmonary hypoplasia Asia. another consequences of such uh, oligohydroamnios occurring such early on in pregnancy with the preterm prom particularly right now all of these complications may happen and remember that it will depend upon at what gestation did the rupture of membranes took place was it term was it preterm or how preterm was it was it pre viable was it nearer to 34 35 weeks or far away from that um how uh, um, how long has it been uh, since leaking are there any other antecedent risk factors is it already a high risk pregnancy like for example is it already a growth restricted fetus or is it already a preeclampsia patient who now has also had uh, you know uh, pre labor rupture of membranes is there any other um, risk factor pertaining to infection already there right is it uh, happening in a woman who has uh, had a history of uh, uh, gbs uh, early onset disease in a previous pregnancy so all of these factors will determine how the woman needs to be managed now that she presents with pre labor rupture of membrane so you have to take a thorough history and examine make a diagnosis and make a plan of management right so we're going to talk about these things one by one so let's talk about the clinical evaluation and diagnosis first so let's begin with history okay so when a woman presents with history of leaking that is when you know that yes pre labor rupture of membranes has taken place now you will have to ask her the timing of onset of leakage you want to know now 
at this point in time, how long has it been since she has been leaking? The amount and color, she may be able to tell you if it's greenish, you will think it's meconium stained, is it blood stained, will make you think about the possibility of placental abruption, right? So the color of the lyca, if it's clear, right? Uh, onset of pain, yes, and in relation to the leaking, I mean, right, uh, did pain happen first or leaking happened first, so leaking happened and now she may have presented to you already in labor or she may not be in labor, right, so you have to take care of that about the onset of pain as well to establish your diagnosis of pre-labor rupture of membranes, any history of vaginal bleeding also. And while you are at the history, also take an obstetric history regarding how her pregnancy has been so far to determine any high risk factors which are there in the current pregnancy itself. History of fever also becomes important as a sign of underlying infection. Now one very, very important aspect is to estimate the correct period of gestation because all your management will depend upon, uh, to begin with, what is her uh, gestation? Is she more than 37 weeks or is she less than 37 weeks, right? So you have to correctly estimate that. You can uh, use a reliable menstrual history. Uh, if that is not there, you can base your decision on uh, ultrasonography and the earlier the scan, the better it is at dating a pregnancy. Now moving on, what are the important points that you're going to check in examination, right? So vitals, of course, important, right? Pulse rate, BP, <clears throat> and uh, your um, temperature is very, very important because any fever would go in favor of uh, infection, right? Abdominal examination, so you have calculated the period of gestation and then you have to see whether the fundal height corresponds to that. Your abdominal examination at the outset will give you an idea about fetal presentation, right? It will at least tell you if it's a longitudinal lie or not. It will at least tell you if there's a malpresentation or not, if it's breech or if it's cephalic. I mean, that much you can gauge. Uterine contractions, right? So if she had had leaking, let's say a couple of hours ago, let's say one day ago or two day ago, and then she happened to have contractions, then you could think of the possibility that yes, she has gone into labor uh, now. So you have to check on uterine contractions, right? You have to check on uterine tenderness and tone as well. So if there's uterine tenderness, you start thinking about the possibility of uh, chorioamnionitis, particularly with temperature, okay? Temperature, fever, and uterine tenderness think about chorioamnitis as well with uterine tenderness and you know uh, uh, and contractions you can also think about the possibility of placental abruption An increased uterine tone would also go into the favor of placental abruption happening alongside uh, rupture of membranes so yes when you have to examine the patient you have to keep in mind the consequences that i told you about right because you're on the lookout for making a diagnosis and at the same time evaluating what is her current status Okay, fetal heart rate, okay, so you have to uh, see if the fetus is alive or not, if there's any fetal distress that is there, okay, and of course, uh, this is about the examination part, but yes, you will also have to go for an admission CTG to establish a baseline a fetal well-being status also. Now, after you have completed this much, right, the next step is to perform a sterile per speculum examination because you have to make a diagnosis, right? Now, the biggest confusion when a woman comes with a history of leaking without any other findings, okay, no no fever, no temperature, no, no pain, uh, nothing, no bleeding, nothing doing, right? And she comes with a history of leaking. The one important differential diagnosis is urine, okay? So, yes, you have to establish and see that she is indeed present with leaking per vaginum. The other dis differential diagnosis could be a copious amount of uh, vaginal discharge, vaginitis, infection. Women may confuse that with leaking. So when you take the history of leaking, okay, at that point in time, you should ask the woman, you see, how much was the leaking? Uh, woman can give you a very clear cut history sometimes that, you know, she was sitting and uh, suddenly uh, there was this gush of warm fluid and, you know, it came out from in between her legs and just soaked her all undergarments and soaked her clothes, okay? 
And that kind of history is very significant. The other history that she may give you, because the leaking may not be so rapid and obvious, it may be slow, slow, slow trickle of leaking and slow trickle of amniotic fluid. Then she may give you the history like uh, uh, wherever she sits, she leaves a pool of uh, wetness uh, behind. So that history could be there. So keep in mind that you ask this history. After this, you perform a sterile sperm speculum examination, okay? Now, when you do a purse speculum examination, you could see the cervix, okay? And you could see the amniotic fluid leaking out from the external loss right in front of your own eyes. You could see a pool of secretions onto the blades of the speculum collected and if you've seen like you will not mistake amniotic fluid okay it's it's very it's clear colorless straw colored fluid you can see it coming out from the external os so you can see the amniotic fluid leaking out from the external os and then your diagnosis is made Okay. Now, sometimes there can be a situation where you don't see, you know, fluid leaking out immediately when you put in the speculum. So, you can ask the woman to cough, perform valsalva and with that the liquor may leak out and then you may be able to visualize it. Other than that, maybe even that doesn't happen. And there is some fluid that is collecting inside and Somehow you're not sure because it's if it's like or not, it has mixed with vaginal discharge and you're confused. You're confused if what you're seeing is actually like. After per speculum examination, if your diagnosis is uncertain, then what can you do? Okay, or at times the situation may be that the woman has come with a history of prolonged leaking already and liquor has already leaked out. So there's nothing more left to leak out, right? So even in that circumstance, you may not see any fluid pooling. Again, making your diagnosis uncertain. Then what can you do under those circumstances? Are there any tests that can tell you that whatever fluid is there, it's indeed amniotic? fluid. So there are certain tests which you can use for amniotic fluid. Now, you see, we are going to talk about these tests and I'm going to emphasize on the utility of these tests as well at the same time. See, none of these tests are absolute or 100%. Okay, all of these tests come with their own sensitivity and specificity. How much are they going to help you make the diagnosis will depend upon under what circumstances you're working. Like for example, if you're in low resource settings, you don't have high end tests available with you. You can rely on the cheaper alternatives, isn't it? So let's talk about the cheaper alternatives first, like vaginal fluid pH testing. Okay, so amniotic fluid is alkaline. It has a pH uh, above 7, 7.1, 7.2. Vaginal uh, fl fluid and vaginal secretions are acidic in nature. So when amniotic fluid leaks into the vagina, uh, the, the fluid that collects in the vagina should be alkaline. So pH beyond 6, above 6 uh, will go in favor of the diagnosis of amniotic uh, fluid. So you can test the vaginal fluid uh, pH. We have pH paper strips, litmus paper strips. We have nitrogen paper strips, color change on alkaline uh, exposure. The problem is that even these may not be available in your labor rooms. You are, these are point of care tests, right? You need, need them right in front of you to be able to do them. So many times these are not available. Moreover, the problem with the pH testing is that other secretions that uh, also alter the pH, other alkaline secretions, other alkaline secretions, they can interfere with the interpretation of this pH testing. Okay, like for example, blood, for example, semen, after a recent intercourse, if there has been one, meconium, bacterial vaginosis, which anyways make the secretions alkaline. So these could be, uh, uh, these uh, factors could complicate the interpretation of pH testing okay so they're not very reliable they're, they're fairly sensitive but uh, not very reliable as far as the positive predictive value of these tests is concerned may not be available in your labor rooms then the other test is ferning 
Okay, so if you have a pool of secretions in the vagina, you're not sure it's, if it's amniotic fluid or not, you can take those secretions, put them on a glass slide, uh, let them dry, and then look it up under the microscope. So amniotic fluid dries in a characteristic fern-like pattern because of the presence of sodium and chloride in good amounts in the amniotic fluid. So ferning is uh, exhibited by amniotic fluid. It's if there is ferning, it's very certain of amniotic fluid. Uh, to be able to do this, you do need a microscope at your disposal, but then these are cheaper alternatives to be do, done. The other thing is that when you have to do these kinds of pH testing and ferning test, there should be some secretions to work with. There should be a pool of secretions to work with or to test. And now there are newer tests which you can perform even if there is no vaginal pooling of secretions, okay? So you can, uh, these are the tests you can do on cervical vaginal secretions even if there is no pooling. Now these are tests for amniotic fluid proteins, right? Now these tests are not available widely. They are expensive, so you may not have access to these tests, but for the sake of completing the tests for amniotic fluid, what are these that are marketed? Uh, we have placental alpha micro, macroglobulin 1 uh, comes under trade in Amnisure. It may be different in different countries. Uh, Insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1, actin prom, and a combination of this insulin-like growth factor binding protein with alpha fetoprotein ROM plus. So various, these various, these various kit-based tests, point of care tests, they are marketed and they can also be used. But again, they are also not 100% sensitive and specific, right? Be these tests are basically more useful in ruling out the diagnosis of uh, ruptured membranes or leaking per vagina. Now, having said that, if none of these tests are 100% reliable, okay, then what are we left with? So, I want to go back to this flowchart here. So, when your diagnosis is uncertain, depending upon the availability, you can use the tests for amniotic fluid. But these tests have to be interpreted with a relevant history and examination. There is no substitute for a good history taking and examination. Okay? So, let's say you perform these tests. There has to be a history consistent with leaking to help support the diagnosis. So, tests alone, not useful. Tests with a relevant suggestive history, useful, okay? Keep that in mind. Many times you will be in a situation where you do not have access to these tests. Then what are we left with? Admit and observe over a period of time. We can give her a sterile uh, uh, perineal pad and occasionally we can, you know, check uh, if there is any leaking and the pad is getting wet. And what are the additional investigations that we should be doing or we could be doing? One thing that we are could do while we have admitted the patient and one thing that we often do is perform an ultrasound, okay, to see whether there is any amniotic fluid left inside or not. I will talk about that in a bit, okay. So let me highlight the role of ultrasonography here. So yes, of course, ultrasonography helps you confirm the fetal lie and presentation and everything, right? Makes gives you an idea about fetal well-being, placental localization, right? And very important in this particular case of uh, ruptured membranes, you get an idea about amniotic fluid volume. Now. If there is um, no oligohydramnios, let's say for example, if a woman has come with the complaint of leaking PV, okay, you see no leaking. I'm talking about the initial examination, okay, at that point in time, you see no leaking at that point in time. You perform an ultrasound, 
you have a normal amniotic fluid index. Okay, there is no decreased amount of liquor. All right. Now, how do you how do you interpret it? And let's say you don't even have the tests. I mean, had you had the tests available for leaking, you would have done that. Let's say you don't have the tests available for leaking and you've not been able to do that. What do you do in this circumstance? Do you say it is not leaking? No, you can't. If the woman tells you, no doctor, I had leaking, all my undergarments and clothes got wet. I'm very sure I have leaked. Okay, I've changed and come. That's why I'm dry at this point in time. Okay, so even with a consistent history, I'm telling you, go back to history. With a consistent history, you cannot simply rely on a normal amniotic fluid volume to rule out leaking. You will still have to admit an observancy for yourself. You will still have to admit and observe. Okay. Let's say a woman complained of leaking PV. You did not see any leaking. You do an ultrasound. Okay. And there is no liquor inside. Now there is a very likely possibility you are not seeing any leaking because all the liquor has already leaked out. That is a very good, very good possibility. Okay. But again, you will still have to admit and observe for a while. You will have to go back to history. How consistent is the history of leaking? Right. So there is no substitute to a thorough history taking and clinical examination in these circumstances. But yes, going for the amniotic fluid volume gives you an inherent idea about the amount of liquor. And if there is a ligohydramnios, then you become cautious of the potential complications that you are going to expect in those circumstances. Now, moving on. At the end of your clinical history taking, examination and the additional investigations which you may have done, you have to decide on a management plan for the woman, right? Now, what are the factors that you are going to consider before deciding what to do for this patient, right? So, you have to check the gestational age, okay? That will be your first uh, question to yourself, okay? Like, uh, how do I decide what to do? What is a gestational age? What is the risk of potential complications? How do we determine the risk of potential complications? We did an entire evaluation, a clinical evaluation. We took a history, we did an examination, we checked if it was preterm or not, we checked if there was any malpresentation, right? We checked if there is any, if there was any evidence of any placental abruption. We did a baseline ultrasound. We checked if there was a ligohydroamnios or not already. So you have to consider the patient as a whole, the clinical profile as a whole to establish what is the risk of potential complications in this particular case. Secondly, you have to see if she has not yet gone into labor, what are you expecting? Uh, what is the expected latency? I mean, uh, what do you expect that, uh, will she go into labor soon in the next 12 to 24 hours, 48 hours? Or are you expecting that there is some possibility, some probability that, you know, uh, conservative management will suffice and, you know, she may, we may be able to uh, prolong the pregnancy for another week or two weeks or three weeks like that? Now, that will again depend upon at what gestation the membranes rupture took place. The nearer to term she is, the faster she will go into labor. And the period of latency that you are expecting, latency I define as the moment of leaking, the onset of leaking and the going into labor spontaneously, that period of latency. So, the nearer to term she is, you are expecting lesser period of latency and away from term she is, you're expecting a longer period of latency. All in all, it's usually about two to three weeks at max. Beyond that, you don't gain too much. Now, moving on, like I told you, in all such cases of pre-labor rupture of membranes, hospitalization is recommended, agreed. 
and once you hospitalize, of course, you've done the initial set of workup, you've done an initial set of ultrasound, you have established a baseline CTG for the, for the fetus, established fetal well-being. What are the other additional blood investigations that you're going to send? You need a baseline set of investigations. You need to see a, send a complete blood count right so you need to check the hemoglobin the tlc right a rising tlc especially in the presence of fever will go in favor of infection right uh, c reactive protein it's it's not very specific but it should be included in your baseline investigative workup as well urine routine microscopy and culture Yes, you need to send that as well. Uh, you will be able to pick up group B streptococci uh, colonization in this situation and that makes it a dangerous uh, scenario. Uh, routine uh, testing of HIV, infection testing has to be done. Now, what about high vaginal swab? Uh, Actually, your clinical management does not necessarily change with, change with the uh, high vaginal swabs and their culture sensitivity reports. So it's preferable that you have a baseline to understand that if there is any, um, if, if what kind of organisms are colonizing. Most of the times they're actually going to be polymicrobial. So it does not necessarily change the clinical management or the antibiotic prophylaxis per se. But yes, if you are suspecting infection, okay, on your clinical examination, on this per speculum examination, if you're suspecting infection, you must take a high vaginal swab. Now, this high vaginal swab is not going to be uh, an investigation for group B streptococci screening. So in my last video, I told you when you have to take a group B streptococci screening, you have to take the sample from the lower third of the vagina and the anorectal region. Okay, not a high vaginal swab. So that is different. GBS screening is different. I have an asterisk marked here to determine that you may or may not do it depending upon which kind of guidelines you are following. Okay, so the American College recommends that any patient who presents with a pre-labor rupture of membranes, GBS screening should be included in the workup if it has not been done earlier. The UK guidelines, Royal College says that it's not necessary to do a GBS screening in this situation. It's not done. You anyways have to give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis based on risk factors. And we discussed this in the last video. So if you've not seen that video, go ahead and see it and come back to this video later on. But I'll give you a brief idea here as well that if you have these screening facilities available with you, it's a good idea to have a baseline screening result. But please remember that your clinical management will not change by waiting for the results of these investigations, okay? Many times what happens in clinical practice, a woman may have come to you at term with, uh, you know, rupture membranes, she may already be had a prolonged leaking, then your management is, uh, your management uh, protocol is not going to change whether you have performed this screening or not. Moreover, if you perform a screening at that point in time, right, the results take longer to come with culture-based screening, right? You may not have that window to wait that long to interpret the results. So, so all in all, your clinical management protocol is not necessarily going to change. I will highlight uh, examples as to how so as well. But before that, let me also tell you about per vaginal examination in these cases, okay? Because the patient presents with leaking and ruptured membranes, one goal is to prevent infection and introducing infection, isn't it? So you should be limiting PV examinations as much as possible. Do it only when indicated. You see, when you do a per speculum examination and look at the cervix, right, you can judge Apart from the making the diagnosis, you can also judge additional points like, you know, cervical dilatation, if the os is open, if it's patulous, if the uh, effacement has already occurred. So such kind of information can already also be judged by per speculum examination. So do PV examination only when necessary.
like for example it may be necessary if there is fetal distress and you want to ascertain that is there a cord lying near the os or if is the cord getting compressed or is there a cord cord prolapse another situation where it may be necessary to do a pv is when there is um, uh, you know uterine contractions and uh, she is having intense uterine contractions and you want to see uh, how far uh, along is she in labor and she's already gone into labor and then it is justified to do a pv examination so whether or not you do a pv will depend upon again your clinical examination findings from the very beginning now you'll have to judge whether or not it is reasonable uh, or it will help you change the management or make some important decisions regarding the patient then only do a pv examination as and when indicated don't do it routinely and limit uh, pv examinations because you don't want to introduce infection now once you have done this much all right let's look at the circumstances in which you're going to expedite delivery right expedite delivery means that if she has already gone into labor you allow her to progress in labor or you may even want to augment or hasten the delivery expedite delivery means that if she has not yet gone into labor you would want to induce and let her go in labor that is what expedite delivery means if there is clinical chorioamnionitis if there is already evidence of chorioamnionitis now what is going to give you clinical evidence of chorioamnionitis most important and very consistent finding fever fever is going to be very suggestive of at least antecedent infection or clinical chorioamnionitis tender uterus okay foul smelling vaginal discharge now these could be the findings suggestive of chorioamnionitis sometimes chorioamnionitis patients will also have uh, you know uh, decelerations on ctg trace fetal tachycardia fetal decelerations they also will add to your clinical diagnosis of choreo amnionitis right again i tell you evaluate the patient on the whole clinical findings the presence of fever or not if there is fetal tachycardia if there is uh, decelerations on the ctg trace or if there is raised wbc and raised c reactive protein levels right so not one criteria alone will tell you if clinical chorioamnitis has set in or not you'll have to consider all the parameters and then judge accordingly right and most important and consistent is fever okay don't miss out on that other situation when the fetus is already distressed a non reassuring fetal status you want to expedite delivery placental abruption has already taken place a woman had leaking leaking for so and so many days so many hours and now she presents with a placental abruption there is no conservative management there you have to expedite delivery she's already gone into labor let her go into labor okay uh, the role of tocolysis to forestall labor especially in uh, preterm premature rupture of membrane cases has been tried but uh, general recommendation is that you should avoid tocolysis term prom if she is already term and she has happened to go into a preterm rupture of membranes you should expedite delivery agreed right and then we have this pre viable fetus now with pre viable fetus the usual consensus is that it's too long a time period to actually uh you know try conservative management to come to think of it if membranes have ruptured at 22 weeks 24 weeks how much of latency are you expecting what are you going to gain you know uh, at the most 2 weeks 3 weeks 4 weeks chalo at the most is that going to um, uh, uh, improve fetal survival in your circumstances then you're also dealing with the possibility of pulmonary hypoplasia in the fetus and the more you delay 
delivery, the more is the risk of infection taking place occurring, right? The more is the risk of having clinical chorionitis and all the consequences that we discussed in the very beginning, they increase when you increase the uh, time lapse from the moment of rupture to the uh, delivery that is going to be taking place. So with a pre-viable fetus, it becomes very difficult to justify any conservative management. Okay, so in those circumstances, after obviously thoroughly counseling the patient, it is advisable to expedite delivery. Now, what should be the mode of delivery? Vaginal or cesarean section? Well, prong by itself, okay, leaking by itself, ruptured membranes by itself is not a contraindication to vaginal delivery, neither it is an indication that okay, let us quickly do a cesarean section because I want to prevent infection, no, right. You can and definitely should allow for vaginal delivery, right. So if you are augmenting labor, we can do with, with oxytocin, if you are inducing, you can do that with prostaglandins, right. Oxytocin are preferable and safer in the presence of ruptured, of membr ruptured membranes. Prostaglandins, though not contraindicated, you have to use them very cautiously because of the risk of hyperstimulation. So you can work around that, but you can always allow for vaginal delivery until unless there is an obstetric indication for cesarean section, right? For example, if there is a breach with preterm prom, I might want to go in favor of a cesarean section. But first I have to make the decision whether or not I want the woman to deliver. Once that decision is made, then you decide how to deliver, okay. So vaginal delivery is preferable under most circumstances, even with clinical chorionitis, let me tell you that, okay. Cesarean section for obstetric indications. Again, the importance of examining the patient from history, clinical examination and investigations and everything. So thorough workup is very, very important. Now. Another uh, concern is about the use of antibiotics, right? So when you are expediting delivery and you are achieving a vaginal delivery, should you be giving antibiotics during the course of labor or not, okay? So the antibiotics should be given with these risk factors, right? If it's a known GBS carrier, all right? Now, like I told you, if the woman happens to present you at this moment, let's say for example, she's 37 weeks or 38 weeks, right? And she comes with term prom, all right? Now, if you're not following routine screening, you may not have the results of whether she's a known carrier or not already with you, right? So now you want to perform the screening. You can take the sample, all right? You could wait for the results, which may take 24 hours, 48 hours for the culture reports to come back and I am giving you a clinical situation where a woman has come to you at 37 weeks with leaking, with already 2 days of leaking, with already more than 18 hours of leaking, with already 12 hours of leaking, alright. So you have to weigh the situation, right, that if you do a screening now, is it really going to be helpful, is it going to change your management plan? Right? With that prolonged leaking episode, you may as well want to induce her right away. Right? And she's already had a prolonged leaking episode. You will anyways want to give her intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Right? So keep this in mind. Right? Keep in mind that the clinical profile of the patient will help you determine what investigations are worth waiting for, all right, or what investigations are uh, going to help you change your management plan. But please be mindful of the fact also that if there is a fever, if there is, a, you know, a suspicion of infection, if there is a foul smelling vaginal discharge, right, and if there is a, a vaginal infection that you are suspecting, right, and evidence of infection is glaring in front of you, it's a good idea to go for a baseline high vaginal swab and a GBS screening along with it because uh, 
later on it may help you guide the antibiotic regimen okay so that is one advantage that will be gained by doing a baseline tests in this situation so you'll have to weigh according to the scenario now if there is history of gbs bacteria in current pregnancy you will give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis if there is previous history of gbs disease in newborn you will give antibiotic prophylaxis if there is intrapartum fever you will give intrapartum antibiotics that goes without question right established preterm labor okay she is in established preterm labor with imminent delivery she had a history of leaking and then she went into preterm labor she's going to deliver you've established that by a clinical examination you should be giving intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis now moving on let's talk about the expectant management for pprom expectant management meaning you are waiting now why do you want to wait you want to wait because the fetus is premature your main reason is that your main reason is that the fetus is premature you want to buy time to give steroids you want to buy time at least for some amount of days intrauterine life that may help achieve the fetus some degree of lung maturation right so it is for the fetus that you want to do an expectant management the downside is that the more you do the more prolonged expectant management you do you increase the possibility of infection so we have to strike a balance between the two i'll tell you how so let us see here what are the um, features in expectant management of pprom pre term pre labor rupture of membranes because i'm considering expectant management in cases where the fetus is preterm right so one of the important components is corticosteroids for lung maturity yes you have to give them dexamethasone beta methasone these are the two corticosteroids both are comparable in efficacy all right in india we are using dexamethasone then we have antibiotics for latency make this distinction very clear this is not intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis i'm going for expectant management she is not yet in labor had she been labor already i would have allowed her to progress expectant management in preterm pre labor rupture of membranes i'm giving antibiotics for latency to increase the latency to buy time all right so what are these antibiotics that can be given now the rcog is very clear in this right rcog is very clear in this it says erythromycin oral for 10 days all right and there is a difference in opinion in the american guidelines and what we are following in india is also different right so we can have injectable ampicillin plus injectable erythromycin for 48 hours followed by oral for 5 days so both regimes regimes are fine okay there can be different institutional practices can be different varying from institution to institution so you can choose what is recommended by your institution so antibiotics for latency need to be given what is the other component magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection right now this magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection is to be given if there is imminent delivery right so it doesn't mean that uh, you know uh, she presented with preterm prom right now and uh, uh, you are expecting that your expectant management will extend for 2 weeks 3 weeks and you keep on giving magnesium sulfate for 2 to 3 weeks no it doesn't work like that if she is in imminent labor as in when she goes into imminent labor you have to give her magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection and there are various guidelines as to when should it be given so 
in general yes a slight difference in opinion in royal college and american guidelines but in general when it's less than 30 to 32 weeks with imminent delivery then one should also be giving magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection what's the other aspect maternal fetal monitoring right so all this while that you are following expectant management the patient is hospitalized your baseline investigations have been sent right and all this while you have to keep a watch for any development of complications right what if infection sets in while in the hospital right what if fetal distress happens while in the hospital what if placental abruption happens while in the hospital so you have to know what are the potential complications what could go wrong because you have to keep a watch for that right so you have to repeat your investigations you have to repeat cbc you know at least alternate day while doing this conservative management you should be uh, you know having um, a temperature pulse charting for the uh, mother as well right you should be asking the woman to maintain a daily fetal movement record you could be doing and planning uh, a ctg monitoring for the fetus also at intermittently so you have to do some some sort of maternal fetal monitoring you have to put in place so that you keep a watch over for complications and again as and when this woman see you were following expectant management as and when you decide that she needs to be delivered okay let's say for example you were following expectant management now she has started having fever so now you want to deliver so as and when she starts uh, as and when you decide that now she needs to be induced you want to give up the expectant management or as and when she goes into labor whether you have induced it whether it is spontaneous intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis needs to be given since we are following the risk based approach here that is the strategy 2 which we discussed last time i would say that yes i would give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis with preterm pre labor rupture of membranes as and when that patient goes into labor this is not the same as antibiotics for latency okay keep that in mind and what antibiotics do we give here we've discussed this in the last video now once we are clear with the fundamentals here what are the fundamentals we discussed what is prom pre labor rupture of membranes okay you have to ascertain first make a diagnosis we talked about that thoroughly evaluate her current status based on history clinical examination right add an ultrasound to that add fetal monitoring to that and also add the investigations to that all right now moving on you should be uh, having an idea about the gestational age how you have arrived at that depending on the again re reliable uh, lmp uh, you've calculated from there or you've used an early pregnancy scan by whichever means you have estimated you should have a workable gestational age uh, conclusion all right after that you have to make a management plan all right we also discussed under what circumstances you will expedite the management meaning you will allow her to progress in labor if she's already gone into labor or if she's not yet gone into labor you will induce labor and under what circumstances you have to follow expectant management all right and you have to start with the steroids and the antibiotics for latency and everything in the components we discussed in the previous slide let us now summarize once and for all in one place let us summarize if you've made a diagnosis of prom at this point in time i'm saying pre labor rupture of membranes admit and evaluate thoroughly once you admit and evaluate what are you evaluating confirming gestational age maternal fetal well-being look if she's already in labor check for contractions look for any signs and symptoms suggestive of placental abruption any vaginal bleeding rule out infection like i told you right so if 
you have evidence or suspicion of infection it is a good idea to send a baseline high vaginal swab that may not change your management at the moment but it will help you later on in antibiotic uh, in guiding your antibiotic protocol GBA screening plus minus I say plus minus why because again we have different set of international guidelines working differently here all right so you have to see under what circumstances you are practicing also keep in mind in India also there is no routine GBA screening for all pregnant women what we are doing is risk based intervention right now send the investigations after admitting and evaluating all of these factors she is already in labor let her progress i've talked about antibiotics in the previous slides give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis with high risk factors all right don't forget these high risk factors once you admit and evaluate if she has placental abruption if she has ctg abnormal right if she has clinical chorioamnionitis deliver 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 with clinical chorioamnionitis with infection with fever please give broad spectrum antibiotics and these broad spectrum antibiotics should include coverage for gbs streptococci as well one idea that we follow in our clinical practice is ampicillin gentamicin plus minus metronidazole that works very good another combination is cefazolin plus minus metronidazole that works very good now one combination that we tend to use works very well is ampicillin gentamicin and metronidazole combination or a cefazolin plus metronidazole combination so you have to give a broad spectrum antibiotic coverage and include those antibiotics which will also be effective against group b streptococci right so this is what you are going to do and once you've admitted and evaluated there is no chorioamnionitis there is no complication right now mother and baby both are well then factor in the gestational age also like here okay so if it is term prom right she's already completed 37 weeks delivery is preferable okay she's already 37 weeks expectant management for 12 to 24 hours is also acceptable provided she is known gbs negative and like i told you if a woman comes to you with term prom you may not have enough time to wait for this gbs result right so delivery is preferable under most circumstances and intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis as indicated if risk factors are present i gave you those risk factors in the last video as well as in today's video right so prolonged leaking is one very important risk factor so you should be giving them there also the other is here 24 to 33 6 by 7 weeks okay so she's not completed uh, 34 weeks as of yet so she is less than 34 but more than 24 weeks this 24 the lower limit could be changing depending upon again the period of what what is considered period of viability under what setup nonetheless these are the standard guidelines so if it is preterm prom like this there is no doubt about the management here as long as there is no choreo mother and baby are well okay expectant management antibiotics for latency start the steroids magnesium sulfate as indicated like i told you with imminent delivery at less than 30 to 32 weeks and intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis as and when this woman will go into labor okay now the other scenario is she is more than 34 weeks 
but less than 37 weeks. So she is 36, 6 by 7 weeks. Chalia. All right. Now, this is a gray zone. Why? Because earlier we used to induce, we used to hasten delivery, expedite delivery when she was beyond 34 weeks. Now, with recent evidence coming up that there is some advantage in giving steroids here for pulmonary maturity, okay, to achieve better perinatal and newborn outcome. So, expectant management uh, is equally preferable. All right. So, you have to weigh from case to case basis. All right. So, yes, both options of delivery, right, or expectant management, both options are there. All right. If you are going to go for delivery, you will have to give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis if risk factors are present as indicated. If you are going to go for expectant management, if you are going to go, if you're going to go for expectant management, what are you going to do? You are going to give antibiotics for latency, right? You are going to give steroids. Please be mindful, steroids are given only if there is no choreo, okay? And steroids have not been given earlier only then okay at this gestational age there is no need for neuroprophylaxis all right and then again as and when you will decide to deliver you will have to give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis as indicated okay so keep this in mind now I decided to take up these two lectures for you people. I decided to take up intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis and GBS discussion first and then a PROM discussion because uh, when you read different international guidelines, there are certain things they agree upon and there are certain things that they don't agree upon, right? So not all guidelines are similar. So please be mindful of the fact of where you are practicing, right? What are your institutions? institutional guidelines in place. I have given you the basics to understand uh, that, you know, whatever guidelines are there, you have to see how well you can adapt those guidelines to your circumstances and how they are going to uh, help you plan a clinical management. At the end of it all, what we all want is a good patient outcome and a good baby outcome, right? So, please be mindful of the fact that whatever investigations you are offering, whatever management you are planning, you have to keep in mind your goal. Your goal is to have a healthy baby, healthy mother. Your goal is to prevent complications. If you have these goals in mind, and you know what are the basic steps of history taking, examination, then what are the investigations you are offering, why you are doing those investigations, how are they helping you plan a management, then it becomes a lot more easier to understand these various flowcharts.